Hi, I'm Erin Barnes, founder of Next Generation Wellness, an expert in stress reduction to accelerate weight loss, to accelerate health and to accelerate human performance. We are here today talking about stress and it is a big topic, but so commonly misunderstood. What we don't have to do is go far to hear people say, I am tired, I am stressed, I am busy. And so very often we bundle stress into this physical aspect to the body and we forget all the emotional triggers that occur. So sometimes we may know what the physical things are that we're doing, sometimes not but we're very unaware commonly around the emotional aspects. And when we talk about stress, people often say, I'm emotionally stressed um, because of an event or an experience in their life. When in fact, the triggers are coming from much, much earlier in life that allow us to create that meaning to cause this stress response. So today, what we are going through is all around where these stress triggers come from for you, not your friend, for you. Um, what happens in the body when this occurs so that I believe when we know it, we can change it. What I love and what I aim for with all of my clients and myself is to allow us to live fully, to allow us to live fully and proud with energy, joy, presence, and a sense of satisfaction and achievement versus what so commonly is happening out there in society around feeling distract, distracted, pr pressured into the things that we need to do, depleted and exhausted and reactive and not focused and present. Our challenge today to get this, this feeling proud and, feel, and living a full life comes from these five aspects. And the first aspect is that we feel like often we're on a revolving door versus looking at synergy. So if I was to say I'm feeling fatigued, what we very often do is go to an expert in a field, which is great. But depending on where that is, if it's the parasite expert, if it is the, the expert in neuroscience, if it's the expert, the, the personal trainer, what they will do is look at an aspect of your life and say, it is the parasite um, or the toxin overload that is causing this in the body. And what we must understand that the 11 organ systems in the body work in synergy. And so it's not one particular thing that has caused it. It is this synergistic effect of our experiences, our emotions, our thoughts, our beliefs, the physical habits that we do and the behaviors that have an effect on this physical body, this hormonal side, the metabolic side, the emotional side. So we can't, rather than going through this revolving door of, of experts, that will pick out one area, what we want to do is look and learn around the synergy of the body and what affects it. The second challenge we face today is having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. So knowing that 95% at least of the time through the day we are on autopilot. And the challenge with this is that we are doing the same thing repetitively based on our beliefs from our past and not ever growing. So what we need to do is take on and accept and commit to this growth mindset. What we also are challenged with is looking at these tick box goals, which is what I commonly see, whether it's an eight week challenge, whether it's going on a diet, whether it's working on being a good parent alone, working on being a high performer at work. What it is is this goal of one thing that we tick off when in fact if we committed to look and learn and grow around who we become, I believe who we become is the greatest gift of our life, who we become at the end of that time. So it's not a tick box thing, it is something that we focus on. We nail something, we move on to the next thing. So we must, in order to live fully and proud, be able to have this belief that we must, it's an ongoing lifetime journey, not a tick box goal. The fourth challenge that we are faced with is the lack of clarity. We are reactive emotionally and our behaviors and our thinking respond to that emotion and also our autopilot and our beliefs that have come from the past. So what we miss and what we don't allow ourselves time to do is sit down and get absolute clarity with the feeling and emotions and the thoughts and exactly what every area of our life looks like. And what we sometimes do is perhaps look at one, it might be our physical body. And we cannot succeed in life and live fully and proud looking at one area of life, it does not work. 
And the fifth and final challenge that we face is that we lose focus, knowing 95% of the time we're on autopilot. So it's very normal that when life becomes back to it comes back to baseline, no matter how focused or how, oh, sorry, how, how much we want to achieve a goal, when life becomes stressed or just comes back to normal, we lose focus on what that goal is. So we must understand the triggers and transitions that keep us focused on the goals that we're after. And accountability is big, whether that's through a friend, whether that's through an expert in an area that you're focused on, um, accountability is really important to keep that focus on what we're looking to achieve. So as we dive in to where this stress comes from, I invite you just to take a moment and look and see where am I sitting on this at the moment? So now that you know the things that challenge you around living a very full and proud life, I'd like to share with you the physical aspects of stress before we move into the emotional ones. And the very first trigger that occurs in a physical way to our body and has an effect is, if we can take it, is the things in our environment that cause this. And these might be things like are the toxins in our environment. So we might have the toxins that are inhaled, absorbed and consumed. And so those toxins can come from our environment. If we think of all the places, not just pollution in our environment, but also the things, the little smelly things that poke out and, and um, spray us when we walk into a venue that smell good, but are full fragrances and affect our hormonal system and known carcinogens. It might be absorbed. So we need to understand that anything that is placed on our body goes directly into our bloodstream. And so when we look at knowing that the amount of up to 80% of the chemicals that are in even personal care products, we actually have no idea what the effect is on, on our immune system, on our brain and on our overall health. And that's coming from the environmental working group. If we look at the toxins consumed, yes, preservatives, additives, all of those things, alcohol, there are a lot of toxins coming into our body and our poor liver as a system is challenged to manage that. Not to mention what the stress response is at a hormonal level um, and also uh, damaging the gut. Then we might have a look at another environmental stressor which might be technology um, and the, um, it, uh, the electromagnetic radiation that occurs from that. Some of the research that's coming out about the next, you know, the, the um, 5G, is really frightening and we need to pay attention to that in our homes um, and in our community and look at and understand what stress that causes on our body. Um, we might also look at even distraction in our environment. How often do we walk and do one thing and become distracted? And that response on the body, that physical stress response, that fight, flight or fright response occurs straight away rather than when we are present and living in the moment. Um, then we could look at even our physical clutter. Um, when we look at this clutter, there, are re there is research showing that physical clutter these days is causing the emotions of guilt because we are not using all the things and there's too much in our houses. And it's also um, sensory overload, so it's causing physical stress on the body. So a lot of us, when we look around our homes, our desks, our workplaces, we do understand that there's a lot of physical clutter there, which can cause distraction too, but cause this guilt, emotional response. And we know that negativity, any negative emotion, causes the stress response to occur in the body. The second main physical stressor comes from our diet. <clears throat> and so when we look at that, we must consider things like our bacteria. How much good bacteria, beneficial bacteria do we have in our body? Knowing that beneficial bacteria can help us create nutrients, can help us excrete heavy metals, can help communicate with our neurotransmitters around any emotion, whether that's addiction, whether that's motivation, whether that's our feelings of <clears throat> anxiety, depression, our sleep, our digestive system, these bacteria communicate around all of that. They are so responsible for both our physical health and our emotional health. The other dietary consideration we must look at are our actual food choices. So yeah, are we eating out of packets? Are we choosing foods that are very acidic in nature, knowing that acidic foods feed our pathogenic bacteria, our bad bacteria, and our beautiful alkaline greens and alkaline foods feed our good bacteria? 
if we look at society today, we do consume a very acidic environment, uh, acidic um, food choices, which mean that we're feeding this um, pathogenic bacteria, which is not great for our good bacteria. Are we also, um, we, we need to look at our eating behaviours. So are we actually eating mindfully, knowing that if we don't chew and smell our food um, and we inhale it, then the pressure on that digestive system is very big. So that means that the food particles aren't broken down well, perhaps because we're not smelling it, we're not releasing the digestive enzymes, or perhaps the chunks of food are just too big because we're not chewing. And so when it gets to the stomach, the particles are too big to break down. And of course, then when it goes into the small intestine, there is a lot of pressure on that. And that's where our nutrient absorption comes from. And if we can't get it from the food because it's too giant and the body can't recognize it to break down, we are not gonna get that nutritional um, benefit from the food. So our eating behaviors are really important. Are we eat, drinking water? and, and um, diluting the stomach acid. So how we eat matters. Um, and toxins consumed. So looking at additives, preservatives, everything, the fridge, freezer, pantry, it matters. Um, looking at uh, also hydration. Knowing that we're primarily either water or bacteria. If we are not hydrated, the little microvilli that sit on that intestinal wall become very def deflated. And what happens then is it puts pressure on that intestinal wall, can certainly lead to damage to it, which is what we consider to be leaky gut. And a whole cascade of events happen stressfully, physically in that state. The other thing is, what are our hydration choices? Are we choosing good water? Because so much of the water actually may not kill us, but it's not actually that safe. It can be quite acidic, it can have parasites, cysts, it can have heavy metals, all sorts of chemicals in there too, which our body was never designed to actually fight against. If we look at our third factor that affects our physical stress, we look at movement and recovery. And by that I mean, are we actually getting enough sleep? Now often we sleep, we're putting that off because we are wanting to get so much done in our day that we're minimising the time we're in bed. So we may not get enough time in bed, but the quality may also be um, hindered by our habits leading into sleep time. Are we on technology? Are we watching TV? We know that the majority of the Australian public go home and watch television as their stress reduction um, approach, when in fact it causes physical stress on the body. Um, through this lack of quality sleep. Sleep is the time where we restore and heal and if we are not getting enough of that, the stress response on the body is big. Um, we also need to take a look at how we actually move. Are we in the mindset, which was the very old fashioned mindset of go hard or go home? Because in today's society, while we are busy and stressed and not um, putting the right things in, if we are in that fight or flight stress response and then we go and flog ourselves at the gym, all we are doing is exacerbating that stress response and certainly not allowing recovery. So my question is, are you checking in each day to see whether your, your, your movement habits are suitable for that day? Is today a day I need to train hard? Is today a day that I actually need some sort of restorative practice, whether that's walking outside in nature, getting some sunshine on our skin, which ultimately helps us sleep better at night when, the, sorry, when we get sun on our eyes. Um, we have to ask ourselves, are we um, choosing the best thing for that moment or are we going from what the past said about training hard? If we look at movement, we also want to look at breath and stillness. How many opportunities through the day do we allow for presence and stillness? It matters. How deep is our breath? Are we thoracically breathing? Because that takes us into the stress response. Are we learning and understanding how to capture a deep breath into the belly so that we get that signal to the autonomic nervous system that we are safe and we can heal and restore? Um, often we might breathe when we first get up in the morning if we're lucky and after that we are on reactive and autopilot the rest of the day in a stress response. The very fourth, the, the fourth thing that we must look at that contributes to this physical stress is illness and injury. So we have to look at our past, our past injuries, our past illnesses, um, 
and look at what that stress has, has happened, what, what stress that past and present illness is, is having on the body. So what we know is that, or I know personally, is that I have to work harder in order to have energy and vitality, in order to not have pain because of my history with rheumatoid arthritis. So I have to work harder just to ma maintain the quality of life that I like. Um, but for a lot of people, we actually have to acknowledge that past and accept what we've all done to our bodies in, in days gone by. Um, then we need to look at also our posture. How are we sitting? If we're at the desk all day, are we upright? Are our shoulders back? Is there length and space in our vertebrae? It matters and the stress response on the body when we are like this is not great. Okay, so from a, from a mechanical point of view in the body, this actually has an effect on all the other systems in the body as well. So I hope that helps from a physical aspect. Next, we are going to jump into the emotional drivers of stress and then exactly what happens when stress occurs. So with physical stress, take a little look, acknowledge the things that maybe aren't consistently there, knowing that consistency is our position. It allows us, if we do what we, or, or be exceptional most of the time, it allows us to go with the flow some of the time. But let's be honest around what, which areas actually need some work today. So now we are going to look at the emotional stress triggers. And the first emotional stress trigger is the relationship we have around a situation. So depending on, there's a few areas in here, and let's look at first meaning. So depending on what happens, I can wake up today and it can be raining outside. And I can either be somebody that looks at that and says, Ugh, I don't get to do anything today that I had planned. I don't get to go for a walk. It sucks, I hate the rain. Or I can look at that and say, oh, this feeling, I can snuggle up inside and get some things done at home that I can't normally get. I don't know, but what I'm saying is the meaning we place on a situation matters as far as stress goes. The, um, the storyline we tell about a situation matters. If we create a story that is negative and pessimistic, it will create a stress response in the body. Then we can look at um, situational comparison. So depending on something that's just happened in your life, if we dare get into this place of this shouldn't be happening, um, when we really have no right to believe that we can control anything outside of our behavior at any given moment. But if we go into this situational comparison, looking at somebody else's circumstances about around their relationship or their finances, does it help? We know it doesn't. And yet so often we go into that, I don't deserve this, why do they? So looking at a situation and comparing it. And then we can also look at this relationship to the situation and look at our perception of balance. So do we truly believe that life should be balanced and all the things that we want in life should be perfectly balanced at any given time? And if we truly believe that, we are destined for a stress response because it is very important to understand that we aren't able to balance every area of life. But what we need to do is be very intentional about which of those areas are important to me today and what are the behaviours that support that. So it's important to have clarity around all the areas that support it. So if one is off, the other's lifted up. And then we have the perception of, <clears throat> of control. For the control freaks out there, and I was guilty of that a long time ago, um, and I have to work on it and, and be aware of it still, is that if we control every situation and we truly believe that we have that luxury of controlling out external events, what people say, what happens next, then we will be in a stress response quite a bit. We have to understand that our behavior matters in any given moment, but after that, we have no control because we will always be in this space of disappointment and expectation. And the second area that causes this emotional stress is our relationship to our past. So knowing that we have beliefs, both conscious and unconscious, that drive us and cause either a good life or a very stressed existence. Um, of course, alongside of that, we have trauma and grief. And depending on these two, on how we move through that, how we move through grief around what we've lost, around what the longing is um, around having that thing back 
and also looking and being able to recalibrate what life looks like now depending on who we can talk to, whether we are open about it, what we're doing to move through these will dictate how long this stressful event actually rules our body and causes damage. With our beliefs, we have to understand that we are hardwired from a very young age. Before we are cognitively aware and developed, we look at our experiences and events and we create a story around that based on the emotion and how it makes us feel. So we can have both unconscious and conscious beliefs. And whilst they are unconscious, they drive us, sometimes supportively, but in this stress, stress story, they drive us to do things that we sometimes don't understand why we keep doing them, or they lead to outcomes that we think, why on earth does this keep showing up for me? Those beliefs are frightened parts of us sometimes that push us to do things that we don't even know that we're doing. And what happens with these beliefs is that we, when we have this belief, we look in our environment for everything work, working with our reticular activating system, we look for everything that supports that belief. So of course it makes us repeat that and keep that in autopilot and continue what we've always done. So if I look at beliefs personally, I grew up believing that I had to be brave and strong unconsciously at this point, believing that it was a bad thing to inconvenience people, believing that achievement was my worth and so through that all that leads to when we have these um, beliefs that are sometimes disempowering is that they lead to fear and for me I know consciously now that one of the greatest fears I have is fear of failure so unless I'm aware of it moment by moment and question these beliefs every second of the day, then they will drive me to do things, whether that is um, drive me to not be seen, drive me to not do the thing that would help me succeed at either at home or at work. Um, these beliefs can make us perhaps control situations. So for someone who is, af is afraid of failure, then I would be the person that would control situations because the more control I believe that I have, the less chance of failure. So these beliefs are certainly driving emotional stress and certainly trauma and grief we have to acknowledge and look at how we're moving through them. The third emotional stress trigger comes from our relationship to ourselves. And when we look at this, we have to consider things like our level of awareness. So are we on autopilot or do we have triggers set up and understand our transitions through the day that allow us to stay focused and aware of what we are doing? Do we, um, do, what do we focus on? So are we someone that focuses on the 10% that's not going right in life or are we focusing on the 90% that's great? We can acknowledge our personality types and understand that some are more pessimistic than others, but it isn't a, 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 dis, a, a, a a place that we have to stay in all the time. We can understand that we can change and there's research and studies to show that even if we are pessimistic, we can raise our pe uh, that pessimistic state to be more optimistic. Um, we can look at things around, um, so our personality and emotional needs. So being able to understand what you need when life is busy. So for me personally, I need space, silence, sensitivity and support. I don't want anyone to abandon me, but I don't want them right in my face saying, what's okay, are you okay, what's wrong, what's wrong? And so we need to acknowledge and communicate this with other people, knowing that we're all different and we all have different needs. We can look at our sense of meaning and purpose in life. We all know if we look at ourselves and our children, if we're about to do something or they're about to do something that's really fun and they're enthusiastic about, their emotional state is a really positive one. But if we roll over in bed and look at our day and look and think there is nothing in there meaningful, there is nothing in there that I will get satisfaction from, that I will get enthusiasm from, that I contribute to, then this stress response will occur because of the negative negativity and the negative emotion that arises in that. We can look at self-doubt. Understanding that we all have it and trying to understand where that doubt comes from and when it rises. So it comes back to this awareness a little bit. If we do not develop pockets of space throughout the day to be more self-aware, then this self-doubt creeps in our beliefs drive us and we are repeating everything based on our fears instead of our amazing human potential. 
<clears throat> then we can look at, when we look at our relationship to ourselves, we can look at self-criticism. Now, with self-criticism, we know that when we are in a compassion, we are, we are 75% more compassionate to other people than we are to ourselves. We are born understanding criticism because we are parented naturally in a space um, from a place of protection to say, no, stop doing that. So we look that we, we adopt this criticism as a natural way to protect ourselves. But if we stay critical rather than looking at um, it with curiosity in that situation and what's happening, then we will st be stuck in emotional stress, stuck in hopelessness. Um, and that is not useful for us. So moving to a more compassion, self-compassionate state and understanding how to do that is really important for emotional stress. Then we can have just our emotional intelligence or emotional literacy, knowing that most of us know when we're happy, sad or angry, but don't know exactly how to communicate or don't know all the other emotions that are driving us. So some work in emotional intelligence can certainly help in homes, in workplaces, and managing this relationship to ourself. If we look at um, our, the, the fourth area of emotional stress, then we bring in things such as the roles adopted. So what roles have you consciously or unconsciously adopted? Some may serve you, some may not. So the roles that I took on as a child was to be brave and strong, um, to be the tough one. And how I carried that through in life wasn't positive because then I never let anybody in. I never showed vulnerability and we know enough to know now these days around vulnerability to understand that it is a foundation to ensure that our relationship to others is strong, our relationship to ourself is strong. So it's looking at these roles we've consciously or unconsciously adopted. Um, it's understanding perspective. Uh, perspective, but it's understanding perspective. It's looking at generosity. It's looking at judgment. Now we are, if we are a personality type that is typically very judgmental, the perfectionist types, the thinkers, they will, they will be very judgmental towards other people and very, very judgmental towards themselves, which leads to emotional stress. Um, having perspective or understanding that somebody else's view of something is just as true as yours. Whether you believe it or not, it is. And if we can't adopt that understanding of perspective, we will always be judgmental and not generous towards other people, which will keep us in this emotional stress state. We can look at expectations. Assuming that something will happen with other people. We say or do something and that person should respond in a certain way. My mantra around my behaviour matters but after that I have no control holds true here because it allows me to show up the very best that I can most of the time so that then I can loosen the grip of what other people are doing out there. We have no control over that but if we believe and have expectations on ourself and others, then this emotional stress will occur. If we look at um, our intentions, <clears throat> we can look at our conscious in intentions and our unconscious intentions. So our intentions are the motivation behind an action. And so I might have the conscious intention to walk into my home tonight and be the most loving wife that I possibly can be. But if I have a little frightened part of me, an unconscious intention which says to control, the situation, uh, then what I do, what I feel, how, how that pans out is very different. So I'm most likely to go into the house whilst intentionally wanting to be kind and look around and see the things that have been left around and not where I've wanted them to be and outside of my control. And that frightened part of intention, that fear will drive me to say and do things that I didn't want to do. Now these unconscious and conscious intentions, the motivation, go across every area of life and we certainly need to look at our area and our behaviours to start to shift some of those that don't serve us. Then we can look at our belonging or our sense of belonging. Belong, belonging and connection. Knowing that loneliness, connection, knowing that loneliness drives us. 
um, to this place of emotional stress. Knowing that society is actually getting more lonely, although we're connected digitally, um, then we we are in this when we're in this space of loneliness and negativity then it creates this stress response remembering that stress is perceived or real and every time this perceived stress or this real stress hits the body then there is a hormonal metabolic um, emotional and biochemical response in the body and so what I would like to share with you just now is exactly what all of these emotional stresses do and also what those physical stresses do inside the body and how it leads you to do things from a behavioral point of view, um, an emotional point of view, a mental point of view and a physical point of view. Hopefully by now you've identified some areas that may need a little bit of focus for you in reducing either or both physical and emotional stress. What I would love to share with you now is exactly what happens in this stress response. And so there are a whole lot of things that occur in our body which lead to behavioural, emotional, physical and mental responses. So the first thing that happens in this stress response, whether we're thinking something, whether we're worrying, whether we are not eating nutritious foods, whether we've got chemicals coming on our body, any of those things we spoke about, what it triggers inside of us is this. The very first thing is compromised digestion. That means when we are in this fight, flight or fright response, if it is the moment we're in it and it triggered and it's a really, really severe fight or flight um, response, then there is no, no blood flow to the digestive system. It's all in our extremities so we can run fast. Obviously our body is not worried about digestion, it's more worried about survival. But what occurs is, depending on how stressful that is, even if it's just that low grade level stress and we're sitting at the table and we're eating our food and we're just a bit distracted and a bit busy and looking at the clutter and feeling a bit guilty about it, or the things we didn't get done in the day, then this low level stress will still cause low blood flow to the digestive system. When that happens, then nutrient absorption is low. So we may be eating the right foods, but if we are still in a stress state when we're doing it, then we're not getting the nutrition that we need. For a lot of people these days that are struggling with weight, it's because of this. It's because they're nutritionally starved, maybe not calorie starved, but nutritionally starved, so the body is not willing to let go of that fat. Nutrient usage is high in that fight or flight response. We are churning through magnesium through our B vitamins. And what I see so often today is that we are not getting six handfuls of greens a day for our magnesium. And we are, some people, um, particularly younger generations, are cutting out carbohydrates because they believe that they'll make them put on weight or cutting out meat and not replacing it with, with the right um, other foods to increase B vitamins and, and animal proteins are important for our B vitamins. And so what happens is we're stressed and we're chewing through it and we're not replacing those um, special nutrients. We then get um, bacteria imbalance. Saying before when there is stress, we're actually um, affecting our good bacteria. We're creating acid in the body. So we may be eating all alkaline foods, but if we're stressed and worried and thinking about things in our busyness, then we are creating acid inside the body which will kill off this good bacteria. We then know if the bacteria is not balanced, then our neurotransmitters do not communicate effectively. So things like dopamine, serotonin, histamine, um, GABA, tryptophan, all these things responsible for our emotional well-being, our addiction, our cravings, our motivation, our sleep, our digestion, um, are all affected. And then we can look and say, because of all of this too, then the damage to the intestinal wall is, is, um, is quite high. So we're actually damaging those little junctions that the nutrients normally go through into our bloodstream. And in that state, we cause inflammation um, inside the whole body. So wherever that shows up for you, it could be joint pain, it could be headaches, it could be, um, could be skin conditions. Inflammation shows up differently for us all. This leaky gut um, certainly has an impact on nutritional absorption and also on um, the inflammatory response inside the body. Then over time, if we continue with this state and those 11 organ systems are not getting the nutrients that they need, our metabolic function will start to decline. Our brain clarity, again, blood flow to the digestive system and the brain is compromised. So our brain clarity generally isn't great. 
um, toxin accumulation, whilst all of this is off, we are not effective at getting rid of the toxins that are in our environment. And of course, we have to remember that we're getting more and more of them in our environment. Um, when, our, when we're in this stress state, our blood sugar becomes imbalanced. Um, we crave glucose and we stop burning fat as fuel. So knowing that glucose is a fast burning fuel. And so if we are in this fight or flight mode and we're trying to escape from something in danger, then we want glucose, we want the fast burning fuel, we don't want the slow burning fuel. So for many people, we've actually forgotten how to utilize fat because we're in this state of stress constantly. Then we have what can lead to adrenal dysfunction. So knowing there's different stages of um, stress in the body and initially a little bit of stress can be quite good for productivity when we go into a next level of stress then we find that we have trouble sleeping cortisol remains too high um, and um, and then we can go into this complete adrenal dysfunction or adrenal fatigue where we just can't produce the amount of cortisol we need to which is anti-inflammatory in the right amounts too which can lead to more of this inflammation then over time we get hormonal balance. So it might be our adrenal hormones, it may be our sex hormones, so progesterone and estrogen, knowing that we are unlikely to produce progesterone in a fight or flight response because we're not worried about reproducing. We are more worried about surviving. And so over time, if we keep in this state and we don't produce progesterone, then things like PMS symptoms, menopausal symptoms are much worse. But also what happens is we don't produce progesterone. It's our calming, anti-anxiety, um, and anti and a diuretic so we we get fluidy when we don't have progesterone um, and we're irritable and mean and nasty and not pleasant to be around at all we may become estrogen dominant too which has has a whole lot of other effects on our body including weight gain and irritability and it's just not pleasant so when all of this is happening inside the body because some real or perceived event is occurring we're just thinking a little bit negative today this goes on at some level on the spectrum what it can lead to then is a behavioral consequence. So if we look at eating, we may eat too much or we may eat too little. If we look at sleeping, we may sleep too much or we may sleep too little. If we look at the way that we communicate, if we're feeling off, we tend to withdraw behaviorally and that can lead to isolation, which keeps us in this cycle. If we look at procrastination, it will increase procrastination when we're in this state. Numbing behaviours are um, increased. So things like watching television, social media, technology, spending money, alcohol, sugar, any of these types of numbing behaviours that we adopt because we're feeling off. And then we've got nervous habits in this state because our bacteria is off, our neurotransmitters aren't communi communicating, we're more anxious, then nail biting, pacing, those sorts of nervous habits then are on the, on the increase. We have emotional um, changes within us. So it may be that self-doubt increases. So we all know if we feel tired, that we're more likely to be a bit more, or have that feeling of vulnerability and less confidence. So self-doubt creeps in. Agitation, moodiness, irritability, um, isolation, anxiety, overwhelm, anger. It's just not the space that we want to be in emotionally, but it's occurring from this based on those physical and emotional triggers that we've spoken about. Then we have the physical aspects. Our sleep will be challenged. Um, our sleep will be challenged because of cortisol in the body. Our sleep will be challenged because of blue light and not leading into a really good ritual to go to sleep. Our digestion obviously is compromised. There is pain from inflammation. There may be skin challenges. There may be weight issues. Um, our school, stools might be off. So we may have constipation, diarrhea. We might have um, incomplete evacuation, all sorts of things happening in, the, the, in our stools, which isn't normal. We may have addictions or cravings. Um, our immune system is typically lower. We may have low libido um, and our reproductive system may not be working optimally because of our sex hormone imbalance, which means that reproduction may be difficult. When we look at a mental, um, the mental aspect of life, depression, anxiety, we know that in Australia, one in, um, one in five are uh, experiencing severe to extremely severe anxiety or depression. Um, our memory is off, obviously our brain clarity is, is off because of the blood flow there and because of um, the foods that we're eating sometimes that aren't producing the right hormones. Our concentration is off. We tend to worry more, we tend to be more pessimistic um, and we have poor judgment. So this, this is not how we want to be living life. And so what I know with certainty is that stress 
pervades every aspect of our life. And if we want to live free and proud, then we must commit to that lifelong journey of expanding what we know, um, expanding and highlighting the areas that need work and then taking little, pocket, little pieces at a time so that we can focus on them, nail them and move on. This is not an all or nothing thing. Um, we cannot focus on it all or we are sure to fall short. If this is important for you, if you are experiencing any of these, then I would suggest um, that you certainly touch base. So with my program, Evexia Accelerator, we dive deep into this based on the questions that I ask you, based on a physical assessment of over 60 questions to see which organ systems are under pressure and how we um, then set a framework for that to all recalibrate and also a framework for you to follow to start to work through the emotional challenges with strategies and tools to be able to do that. We then meet up um, for four weeks um, for half an hour sessions for the accountability aspect, knowing that we need that, that accountability. We set you up with a framework of triggers and transitions to keep focus on it so you do not fall short. We don't isolate areas, we look at the whole picture and then bring areas so you know what you're working towards. So Avexia Accelerator is available face to face, it's also available online and it's also available in email format for those people that really find it difficult to make appointments or, or know that they can think better actually without being put on the spot. We acknowledge those personality types. The other option is a 15 minute free consult to talk through some of these things, your greatest challenges and, and some assistance on whether we can move forward and certainly make changes that allow you to live fully and proud and to human potential with joy, vitality and productivity. I hope you've enjoyed this training. If you did, please share it. I know that stress is a big issue that is, is very misunderstood these days because it does come from so many, so many elements. I thank you for being here. Take well, take care and be well.